Okay, we are diving in. To be honest, I only want to see the amp, so we'll just really quickly flip through the rest because I don't want to talk about the Spin Doctors, really. So this is uh, October 1994. As you can see, we have got really hot in the grunge zone here. And yet, still trying to pitch these guitar synths. Dinosaur Jr. I thought this was pretty cool. Jay Maskus from um, Dinosaur Jr. is like a super retro guy. And yet, 94, he's using a Saldano SB77 preamp and a Groove Tubes preamp. Even though he's running like a big muff into it and stuff. And then I think he was running them into the back of Marshall heads. But still, you know, preamps can get the job done too. Good stuff. Here we are, 28 loud amps. I don't know if I'm going to go through all of them. Let's just, let's just dig in, see what we find. Sovtech MiG-100 for $429. The MiG still has the same no-frills single-channel design, but they tamed the high input noise. They were serious here. It says it worked fine. We checked the wiring. Notice that... The fuse wasn't connected. Yikes. The MiG-100 still has the aggressive, dynamic tones we originally dug. The clean sounds are grindy and chunky. Lead tones are fat and intense with tight, low end, plenty of volume. The MiG lacks the crushed glass sparkle of a good Marshall, but it rocks with authority. It sells less than most used 100 watt heads. Carvin VM100 Valve Master. I don't know what the Valve Master is. Takes EL34s or 6L6s. Clean tones impress. Carvin does that. They have, they have good clean tones. The distortion tones are somewhat thin and emphasize high frequencies. Okay. You know, I don't know. Honestly, the Carvin distorted tones are not really historically where it's at. If your tastes lean towards less extreme rock tones, the VM100 is an excellent buy. Hmm. PV Classic 100. TVA price, uh, probably $750. Classic 100 for $750. That's, that's a good... You know, I love the PV Classic. That is a good price. Two channels, all tube. Eight EL34s. Yeah. Eight. EL34s to get to that 100 watt zone. Doesn't have the shark teeth needed to produce aggressive modern rock tones, but it might just be the ticket if you're into classic rock tones or playing blues in a larger club. It's a great all American made all tube amp. Great value. The GK Backline 150. Oh, that's pretty hideous. Now, I like Galen Kruger. Galen Kruger has always made great solid state amps, truth. But the Backline 150 surprised us with its warm tube-like tones, so it's still solid state. The Backline doesn't sound processed. It has some of the best clean tones of any solid state amp in the roundup. A few players didn't like the amps feel while they were playing. Everyone agreed that the sounds were impressive. That's interesting. I've never seen one of those around. Ever. Laney GH100. L, uh, 800 bucks. The Laney blew us away with its amazing tones and versatility. Yep, EL34s or 6L6s. British made amp, chrome face plate. We were amazed by its big beefy sounds. It was quite loud and chunky with definition and pre presence. The clean tones were pleasant with sufficient headroom for stage volumes. Doesn't quite have the guts needed for 90s thrash tones, but it's still a rockin' amp. Everyone agreed that the Laney delivered kick-ass bang for the buck. That thrash thing comes up a lot. So like 94, you know, the Black Album had just come out and all the thrash bands were starting to get big major label releases. Crate GT200, 850 bucks. Solid state tube hybrid. Switchable solid state tube preamp section with solid state power amp. 
The GT200 sounded somewhat smaller and thinner than we expected. You, you expected something amazing out of the crate? All right, we'll just keep reading. Surprisingly, the solid state settings produced more gain and generated more intense death metal tones than the tube setting. Overall, the amp laughed, lacked, not laughed. Uh, that was like a Freudian slip. The amp lacked the beef necessary to rock with authority. It's best for players who don't already own effects processors. How many syllables am I going to put in that word? And want to experiment with various sounds. What does this have effects built in? Did I just skip over that? I forgot that they put out an app with digital effects. 30 presets. Well, that's no fun. Then you don't get to buy any pedals. Randall Century 200, $899. These are good prices. The solid state head had received ecstatic raves from Dimebag to White Zombies J. So we decided to find out what the fuzz was all about. The tone was tight and bright with thick, raunchy distortion. The sustain boost produced a buzzy, fuzzy, fizzy, ideal for modern thrash. The amp lock, lacked bottom end woof necessary for dialing in ultimate death tones. It liked power fifths best in its distortion settings. Sentry's best for rockers weaned on the sound of solid state practice amps driven by stomp box distortions. How do you like that for a recommendation? If you like solid state practice amps and that are boosted by distortions, this is the amp for you. Boy, oh boy. Marshall JCM 900 SLX. It's funny with Marshalls. Every time they put out an amp, everyone hates it until a decade later, and then they're like, oh, that's real good. Because I remember when the 900s came out, and everyone hated them. And then now it's like, they're not so bad. And the 800s, people complain, and then they're not so bad. Everyone wants them. Actually, the 900s are the amp line I know least about. I have played through a few, but... I uh, haven't played through all of them. The SLX goes for hmm, 1429 as tested. It's the latest of Marshall's 100 watt monsters. Features an extra gain stage and utilizes four 12 AX7s in the preamp stage. It's four EL34s, or you could get 5881 tubes which I don't think anyone wanted. I think there was like a problem with quant getting quantity. So the SLX sounds like a Marshall, tough, ready to rumble, but it's high gain tones have more crunch and fat than a jumbo bag of pork rinds. The SLX also generates a cool in-between sounds. Clean tones are average and difficult to obtain at significant volume. High gain tones were especially rich with brilliant shimmering high and tight bass. Marshall simply wants to rock. Rivera K100 Knucklehead, 1295. I like Rivera's. They're unique sounding though. This is a two channel guy. Um, so I mean, no matter what Rivera you get, you're kind of in that Rivera sound. And I also like that they had a thing called a Ninja Boost, which was super cool. Channel two includes a notch mid-range shift and a Ninja Boost. The knucklehead's tones range from crisp, clean, with nice definition, to beefy distortion with lots of chunk. In certain settings, the bottom end is kind of loose, but, well, that's kind of the Rivera thing. But all of the tones are sweet and full. The knucklehead's only weakness is that it doesn't seem to be able to generate a convincing death metal tone. Hmm. Rivera counters this characterization, citing knucklehead users such as Testament and L7. Yeah, I mean, you can get some heavy tones with Rivera stuff. Mucho heavy. You just have to kind of dive into that world. You know, it's a thing. Ampeg VL1002 for 1350. Hey, man, everyone was having multiple tube options here. So they used EL34s. And they say, oh, this is with the, is this with the key? This is the, um, yeah, this is the Lee Jackson designed one. The amp is geared towards players who switch between crunch rhythms and high gain lead tones. The crunch and lead tones are big, harmonically rich, and very modern distortion. The amp is no Marshall copycat. It has a personality of all its own. And then if you lose the key, you're hosed. That was kind of a stupid feature to have a, like a key lock. Weird. BMF. I don't... 
I never understood that and I never saw them. I don't know what a BMF is. Someone must have snuck that into the review. $13.99. What does BMF stand for? Boogie Marshall Fender? That wouldn't be bad. Blues Metal Funk? That's less good. Beck Malmsteen Farner? Almost really good. They just went on forever. Jeez. So what is this thing? The BMF's tones are all very bright and it sounded best paired with a dark sounding humbucker. Well, that's not off to a good start. The bottom end is fuzzy and loose. Why did they even include this thing? Yikes. Oh, so BMF says, the owner says that uh, it was designed for Slash. All right. I don't ever remember seeing Slash do that, use that. Trace Elliott, TVT, Road 80, 1400 bucks. That's not a, Trace Elliott, you know, in my head is bass. Oh, the Road 80s. Clean sounds are funky and bright. LA Studio Funk. The distortion sounds aren't as aggressive as we'd prefer, but they do have an attractive warmth. The Hoffman 4034, 1400 bucks. I don't remember Hoffman very well outside of this review. The single channel amp has a plexi Marshall vibe, delivers sweet, silky harmonic distortion, satisfying lead edge, shimmery chords. Well, that sounds good chord bashers and lead players will appreciate the ease with which Hoffman can be fine-tuned. Does the Plexi Marshall thing pretty well. Mesa Tremo Verb. $1,500. It's got all the rectifier stuff. The spongy, bold, solid-state tube rectifiers. All the looping. Not looping, but effects loop. It's the only head in the roundup with a tremolo. Nice. It's like an AC30 tremolo. I've actually never tried a tremolo verb. I've tried a bunch of rectiverbs, but never a tremolo verb. That's cool. One channel lets you select either clean or vintage high gain modes. The other has blues and modern high gain modes. The clean sounds are warm and dark. The blues adds a hint of overdrive and crunch. Both high gain settings generate thick, harmonically rich distortion. The high gain sounds are not as tight and percussive as some of the other amps, but some players may prefer their harmonic complexity. One of the most versatile amps we tested. I always thought they were it was just a dual rectifier with uh, tremolo and reverb. The Groove Tube Solo 150 coming in at 1750. Those are cool. They're like uh, sweet, sweet like nice. EL34. One tester referred to it as the oldest sounding new amp of the bunch. Cranking up the clean channel's gain delivered satisfying, crunchy Texas blues tones. The scream channel is ideal for dialing in British overdrive sounds, and although the tone is not as complex or harmonically rich as some of the other 100 watt heads, some players really liked the combined settings because it allowed them to mix the clean and scream. Oh yeah, you could like do it in parallel, so you get both going. I never really liked that sound. It's like Pick a lane, man. But, uh, you know, that was a kind of a gimmick people were using. The amp is designed for people, players, who prefer classic, classic tones and have no use for modern hyperbuzz. The Matchless Super Chief. Oh, I love the Chieftain, but I've never tried a Super Chief either. Coming in at 1840 that's actually cheap for a Matchless. EL34s, not the Matchless typical EL84. Single channel. High low gain switch. The Super Chiefs. Oh, wait, how many watts is this? Is it 120 watts? Yeah, I don't think they mention it. I'm thinking it's 120 watts. The Super Chiefs four tone control knob doesn't provide extreme tonal versatility, but no matter where they're set, the amp sounds good. We were able to create huge, glassy 3D clean tones with lots of headroom, even with the gain switch set to the high setting. Regardless of which type of guitar we played, the amp provided complex textures with well-defined highs. We particularly enjoyed the sound of the Super Chief through the Matchless Open Back 210 and 212 cab. Uh, yeah, by the way, the Matchless 212 cab is unreal good. Uh, I would say the best, dude, 212 cab. So good, uh, like Open Back. And it just makes everything sound incredible. The amp sounded amazingly big and bright through this. Like any other amp with such a distinct character, you're either gonna love it or hate the matchless, but if you love it, it's worth the cost at twice the price. 
Saldano Hot Rod 100 Plus. Cool. 1869. Which I have a feeling that's probably close to the price it is now. Used. The latest addition to Saldano's competitively priced hot rod line is his two-channel amp. Normal and overdrive channels with shared EQ. It shares the same high-quality parts that we've encountered with other Saldano products. Four 5881 power tubes. The hot rod's tones are quite intense with a tight in-your-face attack. The amp definitely knows how to rock. The bass is chunky, ballsy, and focused with superb low end grind. The high end exhibits an exaggerated sizzle that doesn't go away no matter how you adjust the EQ. Though lowering the presence control will minimize that effect. Some players will like the Saldano's aggressive edge, while others may not. VHT Pitbull Ultra Lead. Each of the VH, oh, I should say, I love VHT. I love Steve Fryett, he's amazing. Each of the VHT amps we've seen has impressed us with distinct, relentless tones. The pitch the Pitbull Ultra Lead, powered by four hefty KT88 tubes, may be the most impressive one yet. The Ultra Lead features clean and lead rhythm channels, each with separate EQ, boost, and shift. And the lead and rhythm modes have separate gain and volume controls as, wedge, as well as edge switches. With little effort, we dialed in great clean crunch and lead tones. Clean channel was similar to a high watt, with crisp attack and shimmering definition. The rhythm mode has a distinct Marshall-like crunch with its added high-end sparkle that gives VHT its own personality. The lead mode is high-gain Nirvana, with relentless definition, yet little compression. Extreme high-gain settings yielded tight, focused bottom end, superior note definition, and a percussive pummeling attack, producing the most satisfying and stupefying thrash on tones we've ever heard. Yeah, yeah, all good things. So, Fryette sold the VHT name so there's another company running around called VHT, but all the good VHT stuff is Steve Fryette. So if you want VHT stuff, you go to Fryette. And, uh, yeah, the Deliverance, and he still makes all the... He makes everything still. It's just rebranded Fryette. Kendrick, Texas Crude. Two grand. So Kendrick was doing 50s Fender Design reproductions. This one looks like a cross between early 60s furniture and a Jetsons RoboMade. Where is it? Oh, it's up there. That's cool. That's super cool. Plugging into the crude, we detected a strong tweed twin vibe. The clean sounds exhibited a warm 50s Fender characteristic ideal for rockabilly and blues. As we boosted the level, the crude created a rich, harmonically dense distortion with loose bottom and a peculiar buzzy overtone that followed like a second source. Hmm... I say that's intentional. If your tastes lean towards early Fender tweed tones and you don't need a wide variety of sounds, Kendrick may suit your needs. Yeah, that sounds awesome too. Agnator, T O L, standing for tone of life, I think. Uh, Bruce Agnator, he's another wizard, so everything he makes is great. You knew that, right? Coming in just under $2,000. Agnator hasn't yet attained the buzzword status of Bogner, VHT or Saldano, and other amps in its class, but it's only a matter of time before their reputation earns equal acclaim. The four-channel TOL100 has a built-in MIDI interface, which at the time that was pretty sweet. The first two channels share EQ controls and are voiced with American tone characteristics. The other two channels also share EQ controls, but are voiced with British characteristics. Each channel has its own gain and master controls, Channel masters also function as effects and levelers. Overall volume is adjusted with a main level control and a master density control delivers up to 8 dB boost at 100 Hz on all channels. So I used to have the Agnator one sheet which had the preamp on it, the amps and stuff, and I remember distinctly reading this about the density control that it boosts 100 Hz and I remember going, well, what's 100 hertz? What does that mean? It's, uh, it's density, so I know it's like low end, but like, what what makes 100 hertz? I don't know. So if you look at uh, like where the frequencies lay, it's, it's kind of, it's very logical where 
like a hundred is like the bottom. One K, which is a thousand, is the mids, and then ten thousand, ten K is like the highs. So it's just an easy way to mathematically to go, okay, low, mids, and highs. Below 100 kind of goes into the subs, so like a sub or sub section of a bass or the bottom of the kick drum. Uh, you know, if you split 100 to 50, anything below 50 is like super subsonic and almost useless, unless you're, you you just barely touch upon that. But generally, you could almost cut frequencies out below 50 and you'll still be fine, especially on a guitar. But 100 is going to be the, the real beefy bottom of a guitar. And above that is kind of the more woody low mids of that. Anyway, I guess I'm just explaining it in case there was anyone else out there that had no idea what 100 hertz was. And if 8 dB boost even mattered. But that's a lot of 100 hertz. That's beefy. The TOL... Cr- the TOL 100 creates an impressive array of sounds. The first channel generates full, warm, and articulated clean tones. The second channel is more aggressive and chunky with substantial bite. The fourth and third and fourth channel produces ridiculously saturated high gain tones that remain very clear, defined at full bore settings. Surprisingly, the amp retains its tonal character through all four channels, simply adding increased amounts of gain in each subsequent channel ties with VHT in the high gain sweepstakes, producing tight in-your-face tones that will satisfy the rudest demands of any power thrash guitarists. That's the benchmark <laughs> of high gain. It's like, are you, are you thrash guitarists? Um, which is fair, because that's what I was thinking at the time, too. Few amps can match the Ignator's aggressiveness or versatility. Uh, you know, to this day, they're so good. They're super versatile. All right, Jared Lee IG290. I don't, I never heard of this. Three all tube stereo. Oh, it's a stereo head, class AB or switchable to class A mode. That was pretty fancy. Uh, they're saying it's not particularly loud and it's not the plug in and whale kind of vibe. It's semi pleasant, somewhat compressed, <laughs> a little flat sounding. There's promise here, but they're like, on the plus side, it's stereo. So that's, I guess, a hard pass. The Fender Tone Master, coming in at two grand. I used to have one of these. It was the loudest thing I've ever heard in my life. Absolutely. It was off and insanely loud. So when you're on stage, if you're like, oh, I just need a little more, and then it just takes your head off. But I never really loved it, but like our bass player... He would always be like, yeah, man, that's the sound. I'm like, I don't know, dude. But, you know, I had different tastes then. (sighs) Its toothy, pugnacious tones were still fresh in our memory. The two-channel amp has separate fat switches. The hot channel features a gain control. The clean channel produces clean, cutting tones similar to the Tone Master's custom shop sibling, the Vibro King, though not quite as lush. String-to-string definition is particularly stunning. The hot channel packs considerable punch. This channel is quite aggressive and loud. We thought the amp sounded best when paired with a 57 Strat. The Tone Master has more than sufficient treble response, even with the treble controls turned all the way down. We found the amp very bright, more than any previous Fender amp. The Tone Master is not for the weak-hearted or mild-mannered. On stage, it projects like a mother. That's true. Try this head if you're having problems cutting through the band. Demeter TGA3 100. For two thousand four hundred ninety-five dollars, I also love Demeter, by the way. Um, brilliant guy. His mic pre's are awesome. Compressors are awesome. His pedals are awesome. His amps are awesome. His DI's are awesome. The TGA3 is a head-only version of the combo. Either sixty-five fifties or fifty-eight eighty-one tubes. Half power switch. Channel two and three share the same EQ, but have separate volume and gain controls. With the Fender-like tones and considerable headroom, the clean channels impressed us the most. We got nice distorted tones from channel 2 and 3, the latter providing more gain. The distortion tones are fat, with good presence and tight definition, but fall more in the classic category than modern over-the-top hysterics. It isn't as aggressive as a Marshall, but sounds more like an overdriven Fender, sweet and sassy. Sassy. 
We prefer the sound of this amp with a Les Paul. Our Strat sounded a little less pleasant through the TGA3. The versatile Demeter is ideal for blues and rock hits, gigs, so they kind of missed the mark there, I think. Because, yeah, it sounds a little... I had one of these also. And now I have the preamp, so I know this really well. Yes, it will kind of do Fender-y stuff, and it will do, like, Fender Plexi, kind of in the world of that. And kind of Dumble-ish. Um, that channel, like, one is super versatile and amazing. And it does get aggressive in a different way, because, like, as it starts to distort, the distortion kind of gets almost like a fuzz, uh, as you would... If you listen to the first and second, or any Stone Temple Pilots album, when it goes to the heaviest stuff ever, that's the Demeter, especially the first album. It just sounds like raw Demeter, um, just with that Intel effects on it with a nice big chorus and a VHT power amp. Yeah. But the head too, the head's a little less scooped because the VHT twenty one fifty is a little scoopy, and actually the classic is nice and punchy. But still, the the Demeter power amp section was a little more fendery. But still, I don't know that thing it, that could get big and heavy. Bogner Ecstasy one hundred B for twenty five hundred bucks. Yeah, man, that's that's how much you could get one for used. Despite its difficult to understand control layout, which is not really the case, but I guess at the time it had a lot of switches. Excursion switches, mode switches, or new old sound style switches, high quality parts. Uh, this one had a class A and a class AB switch to switch back and forth, but their amp started blowing fuses when they experimented with that. So they just stuck with class AB EL34s. The clean channel delivered many musical tones. One setting sounded like the biggest, baddest twin we've ever experienced, although it lacked some of the sparkle. That sounds about right. Yeah, that's that's it. The amp has immense clean channel headroom, producing the loudest clean tones of any amp in the roundup. We initially had trouble finding distortion tones we like. What? But with a little tweaking, we were able to dial in some very potential metal and high gain thrash sounds. We'll come back to that. No matter where we set the tone controls or switches, the Bogner always sounded believable, but not necessarily refined. If you are a meticulous tone tweaker who doesn't mind spending extra time dialing in your sounds, the ecstasy might be your bucket of bolts. Now, I remember reading this. I must have read this a billion times, but... Um, geez, the thought that you have ecstasy and you can't dial in some distortion zone tones that you like... That's crazy. Although, like, the ecstasy is a little warmer than your typical thrash thing. But even at that, you could get some great thrash sounds out of that. Or have metal. I, these guys must have had their ears blown out by the time they got to the ecstasy. They were on, like, amp 10. All right. I'm going to let... I'm just going to let it be and move on. Angle Savage 120. Chrome jail bar front panel, dual presence and master controls. The amp doesn't seem like it's designed for easy serviceability, but you probably don't care because it's never going to break. The Savage is loud with super beefy distortion. Lots of clanging. We got tones ranging from clear and clean to rock and high gain death tones. Two 6550s power the amp that seem to give its percussive metallic character. It's suitable for heavy metal styles. The Wizard Metal 100W. With its single channel design and simple control layout, the Wizard Metal seems inspired by classic underwater heads. Because the Wizard's logo looks like it was pilfered by some... Because the Wizard's logo looked like it was pilfered from some defunct 80s Hollywood glam band, we expected to get a weedly deedly mosquito tones when we plugged in. Instead, we were greeted, make that assaulted, by the wizard's crunchy, grindy, and ballsy balls. I don't remember what we were talking about, balls. Uh, Malcolm Young balls. This macho monster pounds the power tubes into submission, retaining all the chunk and picks on the string. 
The amp's tones are ice beaky bright with a Strat, more attractive with a humbucker equipped guitar. We engaged the Z Mods pull switch. Are we still talking about the wizard? Yeah. I thought maybe we went to a Dr. Z or something. Uh, Z Mod pull switch, which we were besieged by rampant feedback. Okay. Turning off the power, we experienced a sound similar to a paperclip being flushed down a toilet. Well, that can't be good. If you've always lusted for bodacious ACDC crunch, the wizard is your highway to hell. Oh, sorry, I messed that up. Your highway to high gain hell. And a Diaz 100, CD 100. Uh, I, I have a special uh, place in my heart for Diaz. I like his amps. Caesar Diaz. If you got three grand, you could get one of his CD 100s. He earned his reputation repairing amps for players such as Clapton and Stevie Ray Vaughan, and now he's making a full line of amps. The EQ section consists of high and low EQ controls. No mid knob. The circuit looks similar to what a single channel twin reverb would be. We've noticed lots of new old stock parts, including a power transformer for a Fender Basement 70. The amp is high and wire. That's really weird, but all right. We got excellent blues tones out of the CD100. It sounds like a hardworking Fender combo, only twice as loud. The amp has considerable gain and is perfect for generating fat overdriven leads, crunchy, tough rhythm tones, and the reverb is big and spacious, though it was a little too wet for many of our testers' tastes. The amp isn't especially versatile, but if you long for righteous blues tones at excruciating volume, for a few amps can touch can match the guts of the Diaz. Well, I don't know if anyone yearns for excruciating volume these days, but those are really great sounding. And if you can plug it into a load box, you're good to go. And this, uh, this old amp, the old Dumble Overdrive Special for $5,000. If you could ever have gotten one for $5,000. Oh, the mighty Dumble. That elusive legend of tone. We've been fortunate enough to check out many of Dumble's early designs. But thanks to Joey Brazler of Making Music, we got our hands on this one. Single channel. Huge blob of orange silicon seal, obscured an array of mysterious parts. This may keep Dumble's tone voodoo a secret, but makes it servicing it a problem. Trying out various single coil and humber burkers, uh, we noticed that the amp produced unique clean tones with high end shimmer and strong toothy definition. The overdriven tones are clean and defined, retaining a lot of string zing. The amp can generate mondo amounts of sustain, especially when using a FET input. The FET input. The tones are defined and not the least bit compressed. Some of the testers felt the amp's dynamic response to picking nuances resulted in tones that lacked sweetness. But the overdrive sure can deliver aggressive metal tones if you want them. Man, it was just a room full of metal heads. Far from a plug-and-play amp, the Dumble requires a considerable bet a considerable amount of knob tweaking to get the best sounds. Dumble replied, Dumble actually replied, the experiences of encountering tones that lacked sweetness are much the opposite of what is obtained by my clients. Yeah, he was basically saying you guys are idiots. Is the Dumble worth five grand? Players like Robin Ford and Larry Carlton think so. At this price, the Dumble certainly isn't for anybody. Well, geez, are you kidding me? Sell them for a hundred grand now. If you're, a discermin if you're a discriminating player with a refined technique and well-defined ear for nuance, the Dumble may seem like your only alternative. Alexander Dumble notes that he is only able to make one or two of these amps per year and adds that he's currently looking for a U.S.-based manufacturer to produce the Overdrive Special in larger numbers. Oh, he missed the boat there. Because then Two Rock came along and those other ones, and they're like, we'll just make it and not pay you any money. So, poor Dumble. It's kind of you snooze, you lose on that one. Yikes. Nice. All right, so I'm going to assume you're probably... Okay, so I'm going to assume most of you are probably asleep at this point, so I will quietly thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you later.